Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Talk 20 MHK. Talk 20 MHK is a collaborative project of UFM, Community Learning Center, and Manhattan Public Library, uh, focused on building strong community connections by giving individuals a platform to share their knowledge, stories, and skills with others in the community. Uh, my name is Daniel Ayrton. Uh, I am faculty at K-State over in the library. Um, I uh, became part of Talk 20 MHK two years ago at the uh, inaugural Talk 20 uh, when I presented on uh, Armazzare, which is the Italian art of fighting from the 15th century. Uh, we're still on YouTube. You can find those uh, previous ones. And uh, uh, I, I'm wearing a much fancier suit in, in, that, uh, in that talk. Uh, this event would not be possible without the six presenters you will hear from tonight. Uh, we sincerely appreciate each of them uh, stepping up and responding to the call for presenters, fearlessly coming along with UFM and Manhattan Public Library for this journey that is Talk 20 MHK. Each presenter is sharing a piece of themselves with you tonight, their passion, their hobby, their project, their experience. Uh, we also want to thank each of you for being here tonight and taking the time to attend. Uh, thank you also uh, to those tuning in on the live stream. So many people have asked, what is Talk 20 MHK? Technically, it is six presenters talking for 20 seconds each on 20 sides about their given topic, no exceptions. Topics have ranged from paddling the Kansas waterways to sword fighting. If you or someone you know would be a great Talk 20 MHK presenter, uh, you're in luck. Our next event will be held September 26, 2019, and the invitation for presentation proposals is open now at talk20mhk.org. We are live streaming tonight's event on our website, uh, Talk 20 MHK. Videos of the presentations will be archived there. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of all presentations. Uh, please hold your questions until that time. There will also be snacks and drinks at the end of the evening, graciously provided by the Friends of Manhattan Public Library. We encourage you to stick around to ask additional questions and make connections. Uh, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, hearing devices are available. Please let a library staff person know if you need one. Uh, will uh, library staff please wave? Thank you, Mary. Uh, restrooms are out in the atrium. Uh, cell phones off, please. And uh, give your undivided attention to each presenter and show your appreciation for them with applause at the end of their presentation. Uh, write down your questions for each presenter as there will be time for a Q&A at the end of all presentations. And we will conclude by 8.30 p.m. and the library closes at 9. Uh, thank you again for attending this evening. We will begin the presentations now. Uh oh, we got to switch something. Give us just a moment. with uh, Lauren Holmes Larry is a yoga instructor, ballet teacher, and plant-based health coach. She enjoys researching, speaking, and teaching about sustainability in local communities for all people. Lauren holds a psychology degree from Howard University and a plant-based nutrition certification from Cornell University. In her spare time, Lauren volunteers with Green Apple Bikes and enjoys hiking with her husband. Please welcome Lauren Holmes Larry. Sustainability. Well, our first question with sustainability is, what is it and how do we make it accessible? It's the meeting the needs of the planet along with the needs of all of the humans that are on the planet. We can't have one without the other. So as we go on and we discuss these things, um, we wanna make sure that we understand what accessibility is. That means that everyone can do something regardless of where they were born, how they were born, what sort of abilities they have. We all have different abilities. Some of us were born without certain abilities. So it's really kind of making things so that everyone is able to do them. It's beyond the plastic. 
It is not straws. It's not just plastic bottles. I'm not going to throw away anyone's plastic bottles. Um, that's a lot of gatekeeping. So when we think about sustainability, we're not just thinking about one thing. It's a much broader topic. It's making sure people have enough food, enough water, things like clean air. There are places in this country right now where children don't have access to fresh water. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about is food waste and food deserts. Because once people have fresh food, they're not going to throw away as much food. Because a lot of times, what's taking up the most space in our landfills is food waste. It's the rotten celery, it's the banana that rolls up under the, you know, rolls up under the tile. It's there, you know, that's what's in our landfill. So it's making sure that we have what's fresh. So here's how we, we reduce food waste. It's planning our meals. It's keeping food where we can see it, see it, and it's eating within season and supporting local farmers, which is so important. It lowers our carbon footprint and it boosts the local economy. How do we address these issues? Well, we give people fair and livable wages. We make sure that they have access to things like um, farmer's market, that the farmer's market isn't just on one side of town. Maybe it needs to be shifted and moved to another side of town so that those people are lowering their carbon footprint and they also have accessible, clean, fresh food and they're throwing away less. So in order to avoid food waste, you're storing your food properly. Go online, Google it really quick. Most likely, you're probably not putting your bell peppers in exactly the right place. It's purchasing only what you need when you need it. That's creating your meal plan. And we're addressing sustainability also on a micro level, on the personal level. That's when the plastic straws and all that stuff, it gets in. If you want to do that in your personal life, great. But really, it's making sure that we're refusing things in excess, maybe extra packaging and things like that. It's saving things like water, turning off the faucet. It's that really little stuff on a personal level. We have to remember that our voices matter and we're, that we're listening to marginalized communities. The people that are on the outliers, we're trying to protect the planet along with them too. If, you know, if someone needs plastic, that's fine. If we're leaving someone out of our equation of protecting the planet, then we're not protecting the planet. We're not protecting the humans on it. It's growing beyond our comfort zone. So maybe rethinking how we can reuse things that are broken, getting them repaired. Again, you're supporting the local economy. This is really about community and helping everyone. It's getting the educating, the education that we need. We're also thinking of, of course, planning ahead. You're bringing your own items. You're taking a fuel efficient route. So maybe you're not going from one side of town to the other. You're creating a more fuel efficient route so that you are protecting, lowering your carbon footprint, keeping the air cleaner. We, again, like I said, we can't have sustainability without protecting human interests. If we're not protecting everyone on this planet, if we're not listening to people who say these lands are sacred, we're not protecting the planet. We're really thinking and communicating with other people. So you guys are probably asking, well, why is she talking about recycling? Because recycling is actually super complicated. A lot of times you have to recycle things a certain way. Some plastics can be recycled at some recycling centers, but they can't be recycled at others. Some aluminum products can't be recycled in some places. So make sure you're reading those labels. Um, again, a lot of what we think is recyclable is actually not that easy. If you like read the bottom of, your, of the package, it'll say, contact your local recycling facility. You'll contact them, and then you'll find out that, hey, I have to send this someplace else because this is a really special kind of plastic. Um, so most of the products that say that they are recyclable, actually they're more difficult, again, they're more difficult to recycle than we believe. And we've got to tell these companies, hey, either make it biodegradable or make it simply recyclable because we don't have the time or the resources to recycle all these things. Again, we want to talk about voting with your dollars. So you want to make sure that you're eating local, you're investing in local companies, you're investing in companies that have recyclable, maybe even reusable things, and you're not being a jerk about it, okay? Just because you can afford something that's more biodegradable, you're not necessarily 
making someone feel bad. Um, and what's next? We are being creative with how we contact our local officials. So this, again, it goes beyond that kind of that grassroots thing. And we talk to politicians on the local, state, and federal levels. I'm going to close with a quote by Jane Goodall. Um, I was a super big fan of her. It is true that if change does not come about, then we may as well get up, but I firmly believe that there is still time, though it is fast running out. We can do it, but we have to work together as a community, as a state, as a country, and as an entire planet. I totally believe it can happen. Thank you so much. You can follow me at Sunny Sun Kalpa Yoga. Um, and of course, if you have any more questions or if you want to find out where I got some of this information, you can definitely send me a quick email. Thank you. Jacob Miller is studying environmental communication as a graduate student at K-State. A sixth generation Kansan, he has unique reference for Kansas's land, people, and community. In May, he will move to Washington, D.C. with his partner and begin a fellowship with Environment America. But don't worry, he's eventually coming back. His hobbies include writing poetry, playing basketball, and being tall. Please welcome Jacob Miller. I'm a sixth generation Kansan on both sides. A two and a half hour drive aptly covers my Kansas roots with five stops, so buckle up. We'll start in North Newton, head north on I-35 to Salina, go east on I-70 to Abilene, north to Manhattan, and end up in my hometown of Westmoreland, all to emphasize that place matters. I went to Bethel College, a small Mennonite affiliated liberal arts. I was a varsity basketball player where I led the league in rebounds and fouls because of course they have to come together. <laughs> Forensics All-American and student body president. I like to stay Bethel busy, which is the case for most of our student body. We embody the grind of our unique mascot, the threshers. Just as threshing separates the wheat from the chaff, we separate ourselves through hard work. Wheat did not become a profitable crop in Kansas until after Mennonite settlers arrived in 1874 from Russia and brought with them turkey red, a hardy variety well suited to our climate. The type of wheat they threshed is the type we primarily use today, annual monocultures, whose short roots beget excess soil erosion. Another type, perennial polycultures, need not be replanted every year, are grown in mixtures, and whose long roots retain more water, soil, and sequester carbon. These were domesticated and bred by the Land Institute, which was co-founded in 1976 by Wes Jackson, my grandpa. People say we look alike. <laughs> I've grown up listening to his infinite wisdom, which can be summarized by the Land's mission. When people, land, and community are as one, all three members prosper. Wes's wife, Joan, took this stunning picture of the Land's barn, Every September, it becomes the central place for the Prairie Festival, an intellectual hootenanny where plot tours and food trucks punctuate environmental talks. To get away from all the people sometimes, I like to go to my favorite spot overlooking the Smoky Hill River. For me, Salina has been filled with sunsets and longhorns, laughs and stories, philosophy and ethics, plants and plots, grounded thoughts, and off-roading in a Honda Civic. Because as Russ likes to justify it, well, shoot, I'm the president. <laughs> Here he might have taken the phrase, called the cows home, a bit too seriously. <laughs> Next stop is Abilene, where my grandma Dana grew up. She co-founded the land, raised honeybees, and once tended to an acre-sized organic garden. She's been involved in food and environmentalism all her life. And one time in Abilene, she marched in a parade in support of my first cousin, three times removed. 34th President Dwight D. Eisenhower. <laughs> History remembers Ike for his calm presence, but my family likes to remind that as a child, he could be very impatient. For instance, before the amens hit the middle of the table during family prayer after dinner, he'd swivel and bolt in a hurry to get away. Maybe that's how we got the interstate system. <laughs> Ike championed its construction. The first section was built in 56 just west of Topeka. It allows my route drive to pass in a but it also just as easily allows people to leave their places for good. I like Ike, but what happens to a place when it becomes that much easier to leave? To become masters? 
I'll grace the K-State stage with mine in May. We were the first land grant established with the primary pillar of agriculture. Our seal, featuring that original wheat, says rule by obeying nature's law. Though some current agribusiness practices make me question whether we're now trying to rule by mastering nature's law. That's just the environmental communication scholar in me. I've been able to travel and give presentations on my research related to the land's 50-year farm bill and ecosphere studies program. So although I went away to college, I packed my agricultural roots with me. It took me leaving to realize how important it is to come back here. As pioneers traveled along the Oregon Trail west to find more land, they stumbled upon this place and named it Westmoreland. <laughs> Clever, I know. <laughs> Brother is a biosystems engineering student here. Uh, Mom is a Spanish and English teacher, and Dad is a forensics and debate coach. My dad grew up the youngest of nine in a farming family, and essentially took over its daily operations at 13. From that, he carried into our family an indelible work ethic and desire to grow produce. A ton of it. This harvest brought in over 800 onions. Shocking, shockingly, a family of four can't eat 800 onions, <laughs> so they threw them at our church like in the name of the Lord, take these. <laughs> A garden not just of quantity, but variety. Beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes, pickles, peppers, lettuce, spinach, squash, zucchini, broccoli, apples, watermelons, grapes, uh, blackberries, strawberries, peaches, apples, and apricots. We grew all of these at some point. Our story, our place, is its own poetry. I am 15 acres of Flint Hills, cons of prairie my exposition. I'm a winding, steady creek, its silent roar, soothly smooth me to sound sleep. Comforted not by the rush of traffic, but the rush of water. Not rushed, but eagerly engaged. Our family rooted us in this place, grew our values in gardens, built our home in house by building home. They built me. Said hands is for working, heart is for loving, brain critical thinking, entire body measured compassion. As I spend this part of my life moving around and chasing fast knowledge, home will be my only resolution. Because I am home, and it is me. My story is one of privilege. I was lucky to grow up on acres and blessed with a loving family. I haven't had to escape my home like millions of people. And I'm not saying you should run back to the places if they hurt you, no, but we need more Kansas stories because they are disappearing. K-State sociologists estimate that by 2050, half of the population will live in five counties. We're one of the top most move from states. Look, you all have your own photos and talk 20s your own story. Mine isn't unique, but it's uniquely relevant to a time that tells our people, go, stay. I want you to leave this talk remembering two words. Place matters. Although we come from different experiences, we can find common ground in the Kansas ground, for here are plenty of reasons to stay. I found them, and I hope you can too, for we can never escape our roots. Deborah Murray has lived in Manhattan since 1983, and she has been an instructor in the K-State English Department for most of that time. Exploring creativity, a course Deborah has taught for nearly a decade, has helped her remain energized through her caregiving journey, most recently since her spouse's stroke in 2015. Drawing from positive psychology and creative research, Deborah will share how she has actively practiced creativity in order to remain energized while caregiving. In addition to caregiving and teaching, Deborah is also a poet, playwright, and creativity mentor. Please welcome Deborah Murray. This is my family in the mid-1960s. Two, de two decades later, my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's, then dementia. Mom cared for him until his death in 1998. A decade later, mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I became her caregiver. From 2008 to 2015, my mother lived at Meadowlark in Manhattan. In 2015, she died. That same year, my husband, Jerry Dees, had a major debilitating stroke. 
Focusing only on my dad's needs, my mom had nearly martyred herself to his care. I had learned from her example what not to do as well as what to do. It takes effort to avoid burnout and remain energized. This is my view much of the day. Caregiving can be lonely. Of course, self-care is important, but sunshine walks, meditation, yoga, massage, and fresh flowers are not enough. It takes more. I'm fortunate to have good friends who inspire me and keep me smiling, but that's not enough either. Caregiving is grueling, even when you are not a full-time caregiver. To avoid despair takes perspective. Fortunately, for over eight years, I've taught exploring creativity in the English department at K-State. Teaching this course has introduced me to theories of creativity and positive psychology. These ideas have provided perspective and enhanced my life. This is my mom's hand in my hand. Daniel Pink and Barbara Fredrickson have been invaluable in my caregiving journey, introducing me to ways of cultivating positive emotions. Fredrickson identifies 10, and creativity. Pink identifies six aspects. The next several slides use key concepts I've gleaned from one or both of these books. Consciously cultivating positive emotions is crucial. One key way I cultivate positive emotions is to find silliness and laughs wherever I can. This is our five grandchildren. One thing I find amusing, I game my chores, trying to get the dishwasher loaded while Jerry is watching a program I don't like, or putting clothes in the dryer while he's brushing his teeth. Gaming chores gives me a sense of accomplishment rather than resentment. Curiosity is a key trait for creative people. Fortunately, I'm interested in a range of things, attending lectures, reading books about subjects I'm interested in, listening to podcasts. Several of my favorites are listed here, including On Being. After my mom's diagnosis, I journaled and wrote poetry to try to make sense of my thoughts and feelings. One of my favorite poems, The Zombie's Daughter, used the Sestina form. The constraints provided by this form allowed me to get my darkest thoughts down on paper. I wrote a play about the experience of facing my mom's Alzheimer's diagnosis. This play was also about the conflicts my sister and I had about the right thing to do about mom. It was produced at the Manhattan Arts Center last year. Thanks to Sally Bailey and the Drama Therapy Program for their work on the play. I was proud of the production and the discussion following. Audience members seemed to connect with my play. We raised $500 for memory programs at Meadowlark. Connecting with students continues to give me hope for the future. Sharing my caregiving journey with them, as well as how I try to find a work-life balance, helps these difficulties mean something. I also enjoy collaborating with my students on their creative endeavors. My creativity students include composers, podcasters, fashion designers, filmmakers, journalists, educators, and librarians. Staying connected with former students is heartwarming. Daniel Pink and Barbara Fredrickson both talk about the importance of gratitude, which is a lesson I also learned from my parents. Without financial resources and personal connections, caregiving would be even more difficult, if not impossible. I am grateful for my creative friends, some of whom you see in these photos. We support each other's endeavors, sharing our goals, as well as attending plays and other creative events together. These shared events and activities inspire me.
Thanks to Autumn Shoemaker for documenting some of these images of caregiving. I appreciate your respect for our situation. To all caregivers, both paid and unpaid, I appreciate you. Please do what you can to find the emotional support you need. Almost all of us will be caregivers at some point. I hope that the lessons I've learned will help others sustain themselves emotionally for these challenges. When I'm annoyed at being awakened in the middle of the night or the too early morning or frustrated by being tied down by caregiving responsibilities, I try to breathe, focus on the present, and cultivate creativity and positive emotions, including love. Kelly Parr is a native Kansan growing up on a farm in the Rossville and Delia communities. He graduated from Kansas State University. Oh, that's right. I got to switch the thing, don't I? <laughs> you told me that yesterday or Monday. I knew I was going to mess it up. graduated from Kansas State University with a degree in animal science and industry in 1978. Upon graduating, he spent three years in Guatemala as an ag missionary with Mennonite Central Committee. He returned home to get his master's degree in 1984 in adult and occupational education and began a career as a county extension agriculture and 4-H agent. His work with the 4-H youth led him to decide to go into teaching. He got his elementary education degree from K-State and taught third grade in Topeka for many years and was an adjunct professor, professor at Washburn University. He began working for Nancy Larson Publishing in 2004 and is now vice president and co-author of a science curriculum for elementary children. Kelly moved back to Manhattan in 2012. He is an ardent fan of K-State football and basketball. He enjoys the beauty of the Flint Hills, hiking, gardening, and writing in his spare time. He began writing his first book in 2015 after much encouragement from friends to share his family's story. Please welcome Kelly Parr. Winston Churchill said, never give up on something that you can't go a day without thinking about. When I found this quote, it was something that I had to reflect upon something that my mother had said to me because she never went a day without thinking about something in her life. And I'd like to share with you her story tonight and why I think it's important to document one's family history. My mother Wanda was born in uh, Kansas City, Missouri on February 14, 1925. She was adopted by Lynn and Emma Keller of Delia, Kansas. Emma went several years without having any children and they decided to adopt her baby boy. And if, as often happens, they had another son a year after they adopted. Then they decided to adopt my mother four years later, and again, my grandmother had another baby daughter. They had three, three uh, daughters all together. They had five children and were loved the loving family in the Dilly community. It was very, very difficult for my mother, though she loved her family dearly, but she always had a lot of questions about why was she given up for adoption. My grandparents felt it was very important for her to know from an early age that she was adopted, and they were very open and honest with her. But she always loved her parents, but she still had these questions in her mind. Why was she given up for adoption? She was able to find some of the questions out about her family, about her history, because my grandparents gave her their adoption papers when she turned 18. She found out the question to where. She was born at the Willows Maternity Sanitarium in Kansas City. My grandmother said that they went and picked her up by train and they had chosen her. She also found out who she was because on her adopted birth certificate, it said her name was Marcia Hendrickson. On the adoption papers, it actually had Lynn and Emma Keller on it. She never saw her original birth certificate that would have had her birth mother's name and possibly her birth father's name as well. So she knew her last name was Hendrickson and she always wanted to find out more. 
she had another document that gave the uh, blood test that gave her name Marcia. And on this document, there was another one that said Leona May. This was probably a mistake that my grandparents shouldn't have received. It probably should have been redacted. But she knew that her birth mother's name was Leona May Hendrickson. For 66 years, my mother really, really wanted to know more about her birth mother and her family. It was really a difficult time for her to just to accept, you know, even though she loved her family dearly, she always wanted to know more. She gave her papers to, her adoption papers to my sisters and me, and we were able to start doing a little bit of research my, ourselves. My search started in 1991 at the State Historical Society. I was doing some research for my class about Topeka, and I found out that they had the microfish on state censuses. Well, it just kind of dawned on me, well, what if my birth grandmother was actually from Kansas? I had another document that my mother had given to me that showed that her birth mother was 17 when she was born. That would have meant that Leona was born in 1907 or 1908. So I went to the 1910 census and started looking for the Hendrickson name throughout all of the state of Kansas. It was a quite tedious chore. I finally came across a Claude Hendrickson from Havana, Kansas, which was in Montgomery County. I still didn't know if I'd found the right person or not. So I called the Havana post office and talked to the postmistress. She said, no, I've never heard of the Hendrickson family, but I know a man named Bus Wade. He knows everybody here living and dead. And he, she actually gave me his phone number, which wouldn't happen today. He actually heard of, Claude, of Clark Hendrickson and his wife Anna, and they were buried in the cemetery in Havana. And he said, you know, I also know a Claude Hendrickson. He was in my class. He lives in Wichita, Kansas. He gave me his phone number as well. Again, that wouldn't happen today. I gave Claude a call, and he was a little leery at first, but he warmed up, and I told him I was doing some research on my family, and I thought I might be related to some Hendricksons. He started sharing some more information, and then he made the, the first announcement. He had a cousin named Leona Hendrickson, Bretches, who lived in California. That's the first time that I'd heard that Leona was actually living. I still didn't know if it was the right person. Leona lived in Doris, or excuse me, she lived in Doris, California, and I sent her a letter and asked her if it was possibly the Leona May that I was looking for, that my mother had always wanted to find her birth mother. I didn't want to interfere in her life if she wasn't interested, but if she would like to know, I gave her my address. I received a letter that she wrote on June 29, 1991, that said, yes, I think I'm the Leona May that you're looking for. She told me that she had never had a day go by that she didn't think about her baby, Marcia. It was a really difficult time for me to just grasp what had happened and how was I going to tell my mother? Well, I went out and told her, and long story short, my mother and I, two weeks later, went to California and met Leona. It was a wonderful reunion, kind of one of those Oprah moments, <laughs> and we had a really great time with her, and we learned a lot that she was a widow and she never had any other children. The only other person that knew about her having a daughter was her brother. So the answer to the question of why she was given was also found out. Leona had been, became pregnant when she was 16, and when she went to tell the boy that she was pregnant, she found out that he had already gotten married and his wife was pregnant. The boy's family sent them to, Cal to Kansas City where she had my mother. Leona and Wanda found they had so much in common. They loved to hunt, they loved to fish, and they loved to bake and they had a wonderful time just getting to know each other. They also had a lot of interest in the medical information that they learned that helped my mother quite a bit as well. They had 14 years together, and after those 14 years, um, when my mother had passed away, I found these letters, hundreds of letters that my grandmother had written to her, and I found so much information out, and a friend of mine said, you really need to document this. You need to write this down. And so I started writing, and I learned that you could write a book and it was very inexpensive and easy to self-publish. So I wrote a book called My Little Valentine. In this book, it tells about the, the necklace that's on the front, and it says, together we are complete. And this was a, something I found out that my mother had given to my grandmother the first time we went to visit. So as Winston Churchill said, and as my mother said, never give up on something that you never can go a day without thinking about. And I have to be honest, uh, this next one's my favorite. 
Elsa Valarosa de Ayrton is originally from Guayaquil, Ecuador in South America. She started learning English at the age of 13 and hasn't stopped ever since. Elsa has a BA in Languages and Linguistics from Universidad de Guayaquil in Ecuador. She has worked as an ESL, English as a Foreign Language, instructor in K-12 through as well as for adults. In 2014, she was part of the Go Teacher Scholarship Program at K-State, where she completed her Master's in Curriculum and Instruction in English as a Foreign Language. Elsa is a passionate ESL teacher, interpreter, and translator, and she speaks Spanish, English, and French, and bits and pieces of Italian and German. She has also volunteered for the Manhattan Public Library and the initiative Everybody Counts in Manhattan. In her free time, Elsa and her husband Dan work out, read, practice European sword fighting, play board games, travel around the world, and go to rock concerts. Please welcome Elsa Valerezo de Ayrton. On 32, 2017, my family and friends gather in the airport to wish me a good flight. When I arrived in Manhattan Regional Airport the next day, my fiance at the time was waiting there for me. When we came home, that sign was placed in our front yard from a friend, welcome me, welcome me to a new life here in Manhattan. Hello, my name is Elsa Valareso de Arton. And I am one of the many voices of immigrants in the Little Apple. I cannot think of any person that has migrated for pleasure. The reasons might vary, but we're all here for the same common goal, to have a better quality of life. I came in Manhattan for the first time in 2014 as part of a scholarship program, the Go Teacher program that was between the Ecuadorian government and Kansas State University, where I obtained my master's in education, curriculum instruction in English as a foreign language. In 2017, I came back to a librarian who had asked me for my hand in marriage. In two years of living in the Little Apple, I have run into a small number of immigrants with a variety of stories of how we end up here in Manhattan. When we meet a person that shares our language or knows our culture, the joy and warmth is enough for us to calm that feeling of loneliness and isolation that many immigrants have to live with. I have found motherly figures here, and I have also bonded with friends and co-workers who speak a few words in Spanish to me. I am very thankful for my husband, who has learned a few words in Spanish over the years and can reply to me entirely in Spanish, sometimes. But who are we? We are ESL instructors, school teachers, interpreters. We work for ethnic restaurants. We work in construction. We work and study in K-State. We are staying home moms, looking for our children and raising them in a bilingual culture. We participate in volunteering programs. We work and study in K-State. And we're all trying to adjust to a new life in a different country. One of the challenges that we face adapting to a new culture is the lack of representation in the community. Food is one of the first claims that immigrants can think of. Only in South America alone, the variety of traditional food is enormous. I come from a country where uh, food is based on corn, plantains, fresh fish, and seafood. I can find some of the ingredients to replicate my traditional dishes, but I personally lack of the expertise in the kitchen area. <laughs> if I want to eat out, I often choose a Mexican restaurant because of the proximity in the preparation of some traditional dishes. But before coming to the States, I had never had so many tacos in my life. <laughs> Weather can also be a factor in trying to adjust to life in Kansas. Being originally from Ecuador, our weather is pretty mild most of the year. I'm from Guayaquil, the coast where the temperature is between 70 to 100 years, uh, degrees all year long. During Kansas winter, I suffer from long episodes of depression. My body and mind are trying to survive at all costs. I believe many immigrants will agree with me when I say that winter is one of the biggest challenges in adjusting to a new life in the United States. 
So far, what gets me out of bed is some salsa, the music, not the chunky pieces. <laughs> During the winter, all I can think of is how I want to be on the other side of the equator. I also miss some of our country traditions, like the making of años viejos for New Year's in Ecuador. These are paper effigies that can be a few inches to 30 feet tall. And we burn them at the stroke of midnight on New Year's. As I live on the coast and our closest beach is one hour drive, I have a craving for the ocean that the pool or the beach lakes cannot satisfy. <laughs> Sadly, I have also heard multiple stories of microaggressions against my fellow immigrants whose English is a work in progress. Here in Manhattan, a person walked by and somebody made a nasty remark. Here in Manhattan, a bank cashier called the police because a waitress brought 100 singles and wanted to uh, change it for a $100 bill. These bad moments do not represent the essence of Manhattan, but it's only the skewed view of seldom individuals. However, there are a number of opportunities in this beautiful land. USC 383 alone has almost 900 students whose native language is not English. And we have a strong English as a second language program with instructors and para-educators that help students excel in their academic responsibilities while learning English as a second language. We also have a solid interpreter and translation team in place where we interpret for parents during enrollment, parent-teacher conference, and pilot programs such as family engagement tech talks where we help the parents deal with technology. Kansas State University, that serves a much older crowd, tries to have a healthy environment for international students, has also a number of associations and groups for students with different backgrounds. Under the umbrella of K-State International Student and Scholar Services, these associations promote a variety of uh, events that integrates international students into the Manhattan community. As entertainment goes, there are groups like Y3E that offers Noches Latinas at RC Magras. They have different themes and they are usually promoted on Facebook. The best way to get a closer look in our Latin culture is definitely through dancing. Immigrants with religious beliefs can also assist to churches that will offer services in their native languages. The $7 church offers a Sunday service in Spanish at noon. There are also places like the Korean church and the Islamic center. Manhattan also provides education to adult learners. We have a robust program of English as a second language in the Adult Learning Center that is part of the Manhattan Area Technical College, where we reinforce literacy, citizenship, and digital literacy skills. And at the same time, we create a safe environment for immigrants, and we celebrate our journey of struggles and opportunities. I have been lucky to be part of this program as an ESL instructor since 2017. In Manhattan, I found my love and a reason to build a new life. Many immigrants like me have decided to give the little apple a chance to call it home. Because at the end of the day, we all smile in the same language. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Laura Widener has been a Manhattan resident for the past six years. She is originally from California, but feels that she has always been a Midwesterner in her heart. She is an instructional designer with K-State Global Campus and is passionate about working with faculty to improve student learning. She is also passionate about running. She has been running half marathons and triathlons for the past 10 years and feels it has improved her life in many ways. She isn't fast, but she never gives up. Please welcome Laura Widener. Hello, my name is Laura Widener, and I am a turtle. I have been a triathlete and half marathon runner for the last 10 years. 
I am not fast. Just like the story of the tortoise and the hare, I am slow and steady. I don't win any races, but I have won so much more. Today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about my journey and why I believe almost anyone can become a runner. I was never an athlete in my youth. I was a nerd, and nerds aren't athletes, right? At least that was my belief back then. I lacked confidence in my body, and I was usually one of the ones picked last during gym. I rarely exercised unless it was required. I mean, who does this for fun? Many of us struggle with confidence as we grow up. We, it can be hard to break through the mental barriers that really make us struggle to believe in ourselves and take risks. We find it easy to believe in others, but we don't do the same for ourselves. One of my big, the biggest benefits I have found from this experience has been my confidence in myself. I got started as a runner in an unusual way. I did a triathlon. My amazing husband decided to take on the challenge of a triathlon, and I thought he was crazy. But when I attended his first race, I met a fantastic, supportive community of athletes. So I tried it. We literally used the book, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Triathlon. <laughs> Sounds about right. I signed up for a sprint triathlon, trained the best I could, survived the swim, got a flat tire a mile before the end of the bike, walked the 5K, and I was hooked. Never in my life had I relied on my body to get me through an event. Also around this time, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer. It was caught extremely early, and I didn't have to go through radiation and chemotherapy. It changes the way you think when you face your own mortality. What had I been doing with my life? Why hadn't I taken better care of myself? If not now, when? So I persisted. The fact that I'm here talking to you today is a testament to how running has transformed my life. Ten years ago, I never would have had the confidence to stand in front of you. Now, some of you out in the audience may ha always have been athletes, some of you may have started exercising later in life, and some of you may not believe in yourselves yet. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how to get started on your journey. You should ha start small and then celebrate those victories. Force yourself to use positive self-talk Find your cheering squad. Always do the best you are capable of, and never give up. I'll do the classic disclaimer here. I am not a doctor, and I did not stay at a Holiday Inn. <laughs> Check with your doctor before you start an exercise plan. There are some ailments that can be worsened by exercise, but most medical conditions can be improved through healthy movement. I am not an expert in exercise. I just know what worked for me. Starting small can be walking around the block or walking around your living room if it's as cold as it has been this winter. Taking it a little bit further each time. There are numerous couch to 5K plans that can help. If you have joint issues, you can train to run in the pool to help build strength. There's also a class from UFM called Run Happy, Run for Life. Celebrate the small victories by celebrating your accomplishments each day. Every time you keep going, you are awesome. Sometimes you'll get off track, but don't let it derail you completely. Hop back on and keep going. Celebrate who you are and what you are working towards. Stop with the negative self-talk. Would you say that to your best friend? Then you probably shouldn't say it to yourself. You are amazing, you are trying, and you will win the next block, the next mile, the next race. When you start to talk more positively to yourself, it can carry over to all aspects of your life. Find your cheering squad. Here's mine. My sons joined us on runs and triathlons in their use, youth, and even my father at 70 years old did a triathlon with us. And of course, I have my running buddy who convinces me to get out on the road each day with her eagerness to run. Check in with your local community running groups. Manhattan Running Company is incredibly supportive. There are also many social media support groups, too. If you can't find a running one, come join Women for Try, whether you're going to do a triathlon or not. It's an amazingly supportive group of women. Do the best you are capable of. Here's where we get real. I will never win a race, but I don't do this to win. My pace isn't what's important. I am getting out there day after day, putting the work in, trying my best, fixing my thoughts. I have improved over the years, but I will never win, and that's A-OK -okay with me, because I never give up. I persist. 
Sure, there are a few races I've chosen not to do, but I don't let that stop me or discourage me long term. As hard as it is, there is something about this that makes me feel confident in all aspects of my life. If I can do this, I can do anything. You have to find your pace and embrace it. Slow is faster than the person sitting on the couch. Accept who you are and push yourself within that. Don't worry about the super athlete on TV with the 12-pack abs and the two-minute mile. Because they do what they do doesn't devalue what you do. Whatever you need to do to move down the road, that is what you do. There are many times when you need to stop during a run because it's medically not in the best interest to continue. That's okay, but I refuse to quit on myself. I am not going to let my mind beat me. The only way to lose a race is if you never try. The negative self-talk is hard to c overcome. I know. I've been out there many times telling myself how ridiculous I am. Maybe it's just I'm just too stubborn to give up. I started to call myself an athlete, and then I started to believe I was an athlete. I will never win a race, but in many ways I've already run, and you can too. We are all flawed individuals. I will never be an athlete in some people's standards, but I am an athlete. I'm a turtle and I'm proud of what I have accomplished. I hope this has inspired you to get out there and try too. You are awesome and flawed all at the same time, and you can do whatever you set your mind to. Thank you. All right, thank you ladies and gentlemen. That concludes our presentations. Uh, if you'll give us a moment, we are gonna, uh, I think, rearrange a little bit up front here and we will open the mic up for questions for our presenters. Laura, my question is for you. What is your top tip for someone who hates running but wants to love running? Okay. <laughs> so my top tip for someone who hates running but wants to love it is just to continue to get out there and not push yourself too hard. It is absolutely okay to walk. It's, uh, there's a lot of plans out there that are run-walk combinations where you run for two minutes and walk for a minute and run for two minutes, that kind of thing. And so you can kind of build your stamina and build your ability. Um, and at some point, you'll get that runner's high and you'll get hooked. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a question of Kelly of how we can get his book. Um. My book's available at Claflin Books. I see she's here. <laughs> and it's also here at the library. And I also sell it myself, but I really recommend you go to Claflin Books because she's been wonderful in supporting of my book. And I have a second book that's about the willows where my mother was born that's called um, Mansion on a Hill. Next. This is a question about the... Uh, interpreters at the high school. Yes. Yes. Uh, my daughter teaches at Malibu High School, and she mentioned once that there are 40 languages that the students at that high school s speak, and they have to have interpreters to talk to the parents. And I had no idea we had the kind of range here in Manhattan that we have. Where do we get all the interpreters for the more out-of-the-way languages? That will be a question for Emily Cherms, who is in charge of the 
uh, interpreter team in USD 383. Um, actually, the data that I got is from her. Um, I know so far, as I'm involved in the Latino community, that we have a, a strong group of interpreters that will help in Spanish. I also know that thanks to a cohort of Saudi Arabians, there was a program in MHS where they will help the Saudi Arabian students um, to interpret or help them in their academic needs. Um, um, however, I do not know how many other languages do we have as in interpretation or uh, interpreters team. But thank you so much for your question. Um, I have a few questions, so two, I'll limit it to two. So for the, both of you, I'm thinking about sustainability and creativity and how they work together. So how do you keep your sustainability creative? And then, Deborah, how do you keep your creativity, like, how do you sustain that? <laughs> and then, thank you. <laughs> um, and then, just so I can sit down, for you, I'm uh, also a fellow Kansan who really believes in staying here. Did my undergrad here, live in Lawrence now, but I, you're moving, right? So, I guess I'm just thinking about how do you prepare for that, um, knowing how much you love it here, but knowing you may need to go somewhere else. Okay, um, how do I keep my sustainability creative? I really, I, I think on my feet. So if you've noticed, um, I've got like a mason jar that I drink from. It annoys my family to no end. Um, I constantly, I have like chopstick. I've got all sorts of stuff, weird stuff in that bag. I've got like, I believe I've got my chopsticks in there just in case I need to eat. So it's like I'm constantly kind of thinking on my feet and I'm repurposing things. I thought I was going to have to buy a new French press, but I found an old vase that I could reuse the little, you know how you have the little springy part? So I put the springy part into the vase and so it's like, I'm always looking around. I'm like, I can reuse that. Oh, you're going to throw that away? Nope. If you have an empty spaghetti jar, I'm going to rinse, I'm going to be the weird person at your house that rinses it out, and then I'll be down at people's grocery, refilling it with like olive oil or something. So that's how I keep it, I'm always kind of looking around and just looking for new ways to problem solve. That's how I keep things sustainable. You have such good questions. <laughs> so um, I think the sustainability question is key, of course, for, for all caregivers. Um, the Fredrickson book um, quotes her research that to be in optimum health, mental health, physical health, you need to have a three to one ratio of positive emotions to negative emotions. So during difficult times, you need to work those positive emotions even harder. And so I have consciously collected a range of things that help me feel those positive feelings. And in really tough times, I'm thinking, got to get something going here, got to do this, got to do that. And there's also a really good prayer I like, which is essentially help. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, enduring, loving presence. <laughs> and sometimes something shows up. So to the question, uh, how am I feeling making the transition to DC when I have um, such an admiration for this place? Three-part response. One, it is hard. Um, don't show this recording to my partner, but I'm primarily moving there because of her. It's her fault. <laughs> um, no, uh, the second part is I'll find those mechanisms to cope. So when I say I pack my agricultural roots with me, I don't say that lightly. Um, I'll still hold open the door for people. I'll still say, oh, can I sneak on past you there? Uh, <laughs> I'll still be asking, where are the prairie at? You know? um, but then the third part is I look to my idols and exemplars. Um, not that my path is the same as theirs, but uh, for instance, Wes uh, went to Cal State Sacramento to take a position to start the environmental studies program, uh, and it took him going there, I, I think, to come back. Uh, same with Wendell Berry, a notable agrarian um, who went off to Stanford and, and went off to other places. Or, I mean, you could even look at Trevor Noah in The Daily Show, had to uproot from South Africa uh, to come do The Daily Show. So 
a bunch of people that I admire have done this journey. I believe I can too. But I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> I find it fascinating the common thread between all of the presentations tonight. So Elsa, could you take a stab at that kind of same question? How do you bring pieces of your country um, here to your new home? I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, I was actually thinking on, and an answer related to that because I felt how how much we had in common right now. Um, so, how do I cope with the transition? Well, I couldn't do it without the help of my husband. He is amazing. He has been very good to me in showing me. Um, how to live here, really. Um, I can remember when we were dating how excited I was because I saw a sign that said, eat more chicken. And I came to him and I told him, like, this is so funny. I've never seen this. Let me tell you this joke. And he was, sweetie, that's a Chick-fil-A sign. It's been there for <laughs> thousands of years already. <laughs> So he has shown me some of the Kansas ways. Um, and then I think communication is super important. Um, I, I speak a fairly amount of English, I think. Uh, however, I'm always communicating in Spanish. I'm always talking to my students in Spanish because that's our common language. That's what makes us bond. Um, I also communicate tons with my family. I'm always on the phone. We're always on using Snapchat or WhatsApp. Any social media we can, send it, sending us messages, uh, that's important. And uh, I, I, we always try to go back, uh, go home, um, at least for two weeks. Uh, at, at the end of the year, we try to go, which is not enough. Two years of seeing your family and friends, it's never enough and it's always hard to come back and it's always hard to come back at, during winter <laughs> um, but that's that's life that's just life uh, living in in two countries and living in two cultures and I am very proud that my husband now he says that he has two homes too Just so we're clear, there's no limit on the number of questions that you can ask the presenters. <laughs> um, Kelly, this question is for you. Um, so you and I met and talked about your potential presentation. We talked about a, a wide range of ideas that you had, and you settled on um, telling a little bit, a little bit, because you only had you know 20 slides, 20 seconds, to tell the story about your mom finding her birth mother. Um, we hear a lot um, about adoption, you know, in the age that we live in, and I think it's part of it's social media. Um, I have so many questions that I want to ask you. I'm going to try to be direct about this. Um, what would be your advice to someone um, who is maybe wanting to find out who their birth parent is or birth parents are, and then someone who is not wanting. Do you have the same piece of advice for both of them? Um, or can you kind of talk a little bit about that with this group, share that? Sure. Mm -hmm. It's been really interesting for me because I've learned a lot about going through adoption, even though it's not my personal experience, not being adopted myself, but from having experience with my mother. And I also shared that my uncle was adopted as well. My uncle had absolutely no desire to know anything about his birth parents, whereas my mother just had this burning desire to need to know. And in the process of writing the first book, I started to meet a lot of people who were adopted, and they started sharing a lot of stories with me. And the one piece of advice I guess I would say is that it's okay to have that desire and want to look and find out more about your background. And it's okay if you don't want to. You have to be able to accept the fact, though, that you don't know what the information is going to be that you're going to find out. 
and it may be positive, and not everyone has the happy ending like my mom did. A lot of people, it doesn't turn out as positive as what they expect. But finding the answers out, I think, is important, and just getting some answers to themselves, but just being aware that it's not necessarily always going to be what you expect it to be. And it's okay if you don't want to look as well. Yeah. Does that help, that answer for you? <laughs> Deborah, this question's for you. You mentioned your outlets for curiosity um, and information and some of the podcasts that, um, and I couldn't see all the names of the titles, but could you maybe share with the group some additional names of podcasts? Because I know I have some caregivers in my family um, that would probably benefit from those resources as well. Sure. I think especially if you're dealing with... Um, if you're caring for someone who's unable to speak, the house is pretty silent, and so it's nice to have um, the voice of the podcast. Um, I've learned that a lot of the programs that are on um, NPR are also available as podcasts. So I like Fresh Air. Um, she interviews a lot of different people about a range of subjects. Uh, on Being, I mentioned, is one that I really like. Uh, I also like uh, Sounds True, which is kind of new age in a way that I like. Uh, Oprah's uh, Super Soul Sunday TV shows are also now available as podcasts. She also has a master class where a lot of people in a range of, range of fields talk about how they got where they are. In general, I really like uh, nonfiction. I like interviews. Um, what's the Gretchen Rubin? Happiness. Happier, hap the Happiness um, podcast where she and her sister have conversations about actively trying to be happier. That's a good one. I avoid, I, I kind of quit listening to um, even NPR in the morning because that's not a really good way for me to start my day. So <laughs> I like listening to people who are sharing positive ideas, uh, whether it's about literature, movies, music, culture, etc. I definitely am a big fan of podcasts. I don't like, although I know a lot of people who like the scary fictional podcasts, I'm not interested in being scared. <laughs> a question for Lauren. Um, if you have people in your life who are kind of hesitant to get started with this sustainability, but you'd like to get them on board, what are some tips for starting encouraging that habit in other people who may be a little resistant? Um, well, I also teach yoga. So um, I'm going to take this back to yoga. Be patient and do your best to be an example. A lot of times, um, the sustainability, the crowd, or the people that are trying to take care of the plant, it's like, okay, that's that weird hippie stuff. Like, before you know it, she's, she's going to have me, like, you know, growing plants in my car. So take your time um, and give them gifts. So maybe a really cool, like, water bottle or something like that. Because that's so small, and that's such a cool way for them to say, all right, maybe this isn't so bad. And also, just have information on hand. Like if they comment on how nice the weather is, say, well, you know, that's really great that you're interested in nature and we have to protect nature. There are these, treat, you know, knowing about local trees and things like that, a lot of times they'll be like, okay, you know, maybe this stuff isn't so bad. So really be patient and slowly educate in really, really tiny ways, and eventually they'll kind of shift towards you. I have a question for our Laura. Um, what is a, so as a person, like, I guess, when you were first starting out doing some running, how did you start down that path? And then what is, like, a typical workout week for you like now? So I, like I said, I started with triathlon. So it was only two days of running and then two days of biking and two days of swimming. And so it didn't seem so overwhelming. Um, now I 
probably run six days a week of different um, lengths. I'm using a plan by Matt Fitzgerald, which is an 80-20 plan where 80% of my running is low intensity. I'm running in what we call zone one, zone two, where I'm really not pushing myself super hard. And then I'll do intervals to help me with my speed, which again is slow, but I'm trying to improve just to push myself within my, my abilities. And so really, you know, diversifying what you're doing, working strength in, doing yoga, those kinds of things, and then just doing some running to kind of get yourself on the path. I have a question for Lauren. Um, you talked a little bit about something that I would call environmental justice, and I was wondering um, if you know more about that and um, what it means to be sustainable when sustainability seems like a rich white person kind of thing. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, it gets pinned a lot of times as it's for very rich people, it is for white people, it is for people who have the time to go from bulk store to bulk, bulk store, putting things into bags and things like that, and then they're online and they're shaking their fingers and they're like, you have, you know. There was a debate online probably about two years ago about these oranges that were peeled and they were put into containers. And people were furious, but Someone emailed it to me, I'm like, Lauren, aren't you angry? And I'm like, that's so cool. And they're like, it's in plastic. And I'm like, great. Because that means that someone who doesn't have the ability to peel an orange with their hands can open it up, reach in, and eat an orange. That is sustainability. That's taking care of everyone on the planet. And so for us to prevent, like, sustainability from being this really privileged white space. Um, I told my husband I would not go here. <laughs> he's like, you're going to go there, Lauren. He's in the military. He's like, we just, we just moved here. You're going to go there, I know. I'm like, well, here I am, babe. I think he's, he's watching. Um, so it keeps it from being there because when we think about justice and the environment, we talk about Flint, we talk about the pipeline, we talk about people's indigenous and sacred land, and they say, no, this is ours, and we have to protect these lands, and we talk about how we can make those voices heard, so how do we do it? We talk about it, and we get uncomfortable, and we make sure that we're listening to all of those voices, because when we talk about sustainability, it's not just carrying around the mason jar. It's listening to the people online who are saying, I need this plastic. I need these little containers to put my life-saving medication in. Um, I need, you know, I can't use a, not everyone can use a paper straw. I don't know if you use them, but they're terrible. I have my own straw, and on a microcosmic level, that's fine. But for me to sit there and to tell someone, you can't use that plastic straw, that's ableism. Mm -hmm. You see? So we have to constantly check ourselves if we're thinking about sustainability. And we have to know that we come from, most of us have some form of privilege. Um, and that's where I'm going to go with it, because I totally said I was not going to go there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next question. Um, I guess for any or all of the panelists, so um, I appreciate how like personal each one of your stories are. So I guess I'm just thinking about as you were preparing for your presentation, even with these things that you know very well, was there something that surprised you in your preparation even up till today, perhaps? Um, I was surprised as that we only had 20 seconds per topic, <laughs> and sustainability is a huge topic, and so I started practicing, and I'm like, you're going to be talking a mile a minute. Um, I actually went to school in D.C. It is a whole lot faster. This traffic, <laughs> traffic is nothing. Leave out an hour and a half early. You're going to love it, though. Yeah. 
have some surprises as you were preparing? I just agree with Lauren. For me, it was the 20 seconds. I've done the presentation for different things before, and I usually have an hour to talk, and I can just look at a slide, and I can just talk off the top of my head. And I think tonight the thing that surprised me was I've talked about this for three years about the book. This is the first time I've gotten kind of emotional when I was sharing it. I mean, I've shared it, but to really, I don't know what it was tonight that hit me, but it was kind of hard to go through in so quickly and hitting certain things. So that was the thing for me that surprised me. And also, we have so much in common. Mm -hmm. I mean, as we got the first night we practiced, you know, Jake and I weren't Mennonites, and neither one of us are Mennonite, but we both worked with Mennonites. And then my grandmother that I showed you, Emma, she had Alzheimer's, and so did my father. And so we started talking about being caregivers, and then Ecuador, and I'd been in Guatemala, and I wish I could say I was a runner, but I'm not. <laughs> you can be a tourist. Next year. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Next year. Yes. Yes, the time was was a difficult thing for me to understand. 20 seconds, 20 slides. And I'm Latina, I have a lot to say. So so it was very difficult for me. Um, and yes, the I think the common things, the things that bond us, that unite us uh, as a group of presenters, it's been amazing because when I'm listening to Lauren, yes, um, I had to take care of my father uh, he was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, and my father died, and the next month I got married. So it was hard, you know. I, I It was gruesome, and, and everything that she said in her presentation, I have lived it, and I agree with her. And I think one thing that... Um, maybe I wanted to share with uh, the caregiver topic is that we have to be brutally honest with ourselves when we are being care, uh, take, uh, we're taking care of somebody and, um, and just find positive aspects in life, find little things in life. Um, I walk, I don't run. So I'm a turtle too, um, but I'm certainly inspired, even more so inspired tonight to keep going. Uh, I really like when you said that um, going slow is faster for comparing to the person that is on the couch. I, I love that, and I'm going to remember that always. I like the constraints of this short amount of time, and I have learned in terms of uh, being creative that it's helpful to have constraints because you really have to get to the heart of your topic really fast. And as an audience member, because I've been to a couple of these, I always know that I will be at least mildly interested in all of them, and if I'm not that interested, it will be over fast. <laughs> I've got a question for Laura. Okay. Um, I am also a, a sort of a runner. Um, I run probably about five, maybe six days a week. I'm wondering what shoe do you recommend? I know every, I know every foot is different, but do you have a favorite shoe in particular? <laughs> I'm trying not to have this massive thing of shoes, but I feel like I'm trying to keep it down because I'm trying to be sustainable. So. So I happen to use a brand or a type of shoe called Ravina, but honestly, go to the Manhattan Running Company. They are amazing. They will put you on a treadmill. They will watch your stride and the way your foot falls and everything about your foot and help you pick the best shoe for you. And then they also have a very awesome like return policy for if you get out there on a run and it doesn't work for you, you can bring it back to them and they will recycle those and you can choose something else. Else. So that's really the best way because my foot is completely different.
trust me, my husband will say, my feet are terrible. And so um, you know, the shoe that works for me is not necessarily going to work for anyone else. I have a follow-up question for the runner. Um, what apps do you use, or what kind of, how do you keep track of your uh, workouts? So, a um, couple of different fancy ones, but there's also, there are so many. There's a Nike run app that has plans built into it. Um, I'm going to draw a blank on all the different names right now. So. Yeah. Yeah, I get my phone, huh? <laughs> I have several of them <laughs> saved. Um, but there's so many, and there's uh, Hal Higdon is one of the best um, trainers that offers free plans for beginners, and they're all different levels. Um, and he does the run-walk plans. Um, so you can download his... Um, his workouts and his plans for however length you're going to do, 5K, half marathon, 10K, whatever. And then those workouts, and he also does um, podcasts and, and encouragement. And, um, you know, and there are a lot of apps that will do that. You get to a certain point and some, you know, pa Paula Radcliffe comes on and said, you did a great job. You know, it's like, oh, <laughs> Paul Radcliffe just screamed, you know, I know it's a recording, but still, you know, you get a little bit of praise. So there are awesome apps out there that can really help you get started. And that symbol up there, that couch to 5K, was one of the ones that, that's just an app. You can find that symbol. So, cool. <laughs> I, um... So we've been here every year of this, and, and I just find it's fascinating, and, and it's always inspiring to me to, uh, you know, it makes me excited to, to call myself from Manhattan because such neat people, interesting people are here, ones that I would not have normally run into in my small circle. And so I want to thank you all for your inspiring stories, but also for letting uh, sharing yourselves with us. Even in, it felt like a small time to you, but because you were so open with yourselves, it, it felt much larger. And um, I have a tad bit that I mean. Another thing that it does is this this event brings us all together on such a human level. You're talking about how you have something in common with with uh, with each other. And I can think of th uh, things that I can relate to for every single thing that you, you've all s you know, said. Yo hablo español, and I have lived in Guatemala, and we have an adopted son from a Russian orphanage who Unfortunately, that's not a happy ending for him, and uh, so it was wonderful to hear your, and I was a caregiver for my father who just passed away a few months ago, and I have always envied someone who grew up in the same place and lived there and had such a sense of home, as I've lived in many countries and many cities in the U.S., and that has an advantage too. But I've always wanted that, you know, that that home, you know, and and the level of sustainable sustainability um, message. Um, I've been a vegetarian for over fifty years. And um, I always have been a believer that um, running is a waste of perfectly good heartbeats. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows with your inspiration? Thank you. My, my question is for Ms. Valarezo de Ayrton. Um, 
So uh, you, you uh, fluently speak three languages and have um, a, a good grasp of another couple and probably some bits and pieces of a few others in there as well. Um, and you are uh, partnered with um, someone who, while handsome, only speaks the one language. Um, so uh, you've had to adapt to uh, to uh, his language uh, far more than he has adapted to yours. Uh, has this affected um, for you noticeably, like uh, how how you speak? Has it has it changed any of that? And uh, and and sort of as a follow up. Um, is there a language that you tend to uh, think in more? And is there uh, a language that you dream in more? <laughs> no, no pressure at all. <laughs> um, OK. I, I'm trying to uh, think on the first question that you asked, but I got, I got struck by your hair. <laughs> Uh, ha having to having to sort of stoop down to the level of one who only speaks one language uh, has that has that affected you? That was the first part. I don't think that knowing just one language can be an impediment. Can be. Um, something to be ashamed of. So I, I'm, I'm going to say that um, having a spouse that only speaks one language has affected me because it hasn't. Uh, gladly we have found ways to communicate with each other even though if we are completely silent. Um, so I, I don't feel it has affected me because love is universal. Um, for can your second question, what, do you have a primary language in which you think and uh, one in which you dream? Let me tell you that I don't. Um, uh, I think I I can I I dream or I think sometimes in English, and I find myself doing that, and and then it strikes me I have dreams in French. I have no idea what's happening, but I have dreams in French. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sometimes, um, but I think it just it depends on the, the 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 situation, what's happening that activates my language. Um, of course, if I'm seeing something that is happening in Venezuela, if I'm seeing something political that is happening on Ecuador, of course, I'm going to think in in uh, Spanish. Um, I also have a good group of friends and family and co-workers that are, um, they, they know both languages, so they will understand if I start speaking, if I start interchanging languages in the middle of it. Um, I do not do Spanglish. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like sounding like Sofia Vergara. Um, but, but I do tend to switch uh, if I'm in an informal environment or setting uh, from Spanish to English. Uh, one of the things that my husband has, uh, he had had to learn is the word cuidado. It means watch out because I cannot think very fast. Uh, I can, my, my brain cannot translate, hey, watch out. I just go, cuidado. Um, so. <laughs> that's that's how my my brain goes. I I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your question, Mr. Alton. <laughs> my question is on um, the caregiving. Um, um, I loved all your tips beyond the self care. That was wonderful. Um, I've just recently delved into some of that with my grandfather and wasn't expecting to do that in my 30s. <laughs> um, were there some resources that you found in the community that were maybe surprising to you to be able to help you as you were learning end-of-life care or caregiving that aren't your, tip, you know, things that come to mind right off the bat? Like, you know, Meadowlark would have been an, a resource you would have known right off the bat, but others you may not have. I think here's where um, being so curious um, and being a self-directed learner, mm -hmm. Um, most resources I found were books. Actually, quite frankly, there's still, there's a lot of 
I don't know. There's not a lot written about dealing with the emotional aspects, um, but there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot written about some of the more technical aspects. Right. I think this is where the um, podcasts are often helpful. Uh, another one that I'm thinking of now is by a woman who was diagnosed in her 30s with stage four pancreatic cancer. She has a young child, and she's a minister, and um, her book, let's see, it's Kate Bowles. Her book is Everything Happens for a Reason, Except for a Reason is Crossed Out. Mm. And she um, has a lot of really good, hard interviews with people about the kind of things that people don't talk about mm. in public. Mm-hmm. And uh, But in terms of say, support groups or other resources. I think the memory care programs at Meadowlark are quite helpful. By the time my mom got there, she was kind of too far gone, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But, um, and, and actually, they've, they've uh, in, increased the amount of programs that are available there, both for Parkinson's and for Meadowlark, uh, in the last few years. Have you found resources? I'm just starting to gather things and maybe even help others with the same thing, you know, mm-hmm. be able to share the load. So that's there's a pretty yeah. good collection of essays, uh, something like uh, "Dutiful Daughters" on caring for our parents as they grow older, mm-hmm. and they're also really artful because I don't really need a lot of technical medical information. I just really am looking for something that's going to be a good read and give me some. Um, real emotional sustenance. That's great. And then same for anybody else, if there's any surprising resources in, in Manhattan or that in your own journeys that may not may not be on the beaten path that you could suggest, that would be another question. Um, so I think the local communities always have amazing resources for exercise, for running, all of the things that UFM offers, Manhattan Running Company. There's a, a running group that was started through Manhattan, but it's the local locals that are keeping it going. You know, it's just tapping into and going to um, our community learning centers, our libraries, our um, running centers for this, from what I do, and just asking, you know, what's out there? Who do you know in the community that does this too? And then, oh yeah, I can send you to go talk to so and so, and you just find that network. I, I think with that, we do have to uh, conclude our, our official questions. Um, on behalf of the Talk 20 NHK committee uh, from UFM and Manhattan Public Library, thank you so much for attending. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the event, and I uh, hope you will consider presenting. Um, presentation suggestions and proposals are open now on the website, uh, talk20nhk.org. Um, if you'll please join me in giving our presenters one last round of applause. So there's still snacks in the back, food and drink, and uh, feel free to mingle. Uh, The library is open until 9 p.m. Thanks very much.